Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. It's an honor today to welcome Sharon Birch McGrain, who's joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Uh, she's here today to discuss her book, Bayes' Rule, The Theory That Would Not Die. Uh, Sharon is a former newspaper reporter and a former author and editor on topics in physics for Encyclopedia Britannica. We all grew up on that back when it ruled. Um, her first book, Nobel Prize Women in Science, is still in print after 20 years and is published by the National Academies of Science Press. She wrote another book, uh, Prometheans in the Lab, about pioneers in the chemical industry. Uh, this latest book on Bayesian methods and uh, reasoning has been a nice way to bring some of the rich uh, theory, including some controversy about statistical reasoning uh, around Bayesian methods. Uh, I like this quote here, the New York Times book review uh, by John Allen Paulus wrote, quote, if you are not thinking like a Bayesian, perhaps you should be. I think it's better to cite others than to say that myself, although I've known to have been saying things like that over the years. So I've been a Bayesian long before I knew what that meant. Um, I and a colleague, David Herkimen, who I ran into at Stanford University, we were both interested in artificial intelligence, found in those days that uh, we were in a world where probability, where logic and theorem proving reigned, and probability was considered a throwback uh, to uh, ancient numerical methods that had very little to do with reasoning and intelligence. Um, but we and other colleagues found that there was really no other way to, to tackle the complexities of the, of the real world than to embrace probability. And uh, over lunch, I was talking to, uh, to Sharon, and she's been doing even further research on some subtleties about Bayesianism and Microsoft uh, research and Microsoft Corporation. Uh, I had mentioned to her earlier that, that I, I became weak-kneed um, in 1992, in July or August, when I was negotiating with Nathan Mirvold as to why I would ever want to come and join a tiny Microsoft research of six or seven people. And he leaned forward. I remember getting very weak need. He leaned, leaned forward and said, Let's listen to me. Bill Gates is a Bayesian. And he'll support you to really bring this stuff into the world. And I heard a little bit more about that at lunch today. Maybe Sharon can fill us in over, uh, during her talk. Let me turn things over to Sharon so she can share the, the broader uh, story of the theory that would not die. Please uh, join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you for inviting me for that nice introduction, and uh, thank you for coming today. I always start all of my talks with some truth in advertising and say that I am not a scientist or engineer or mathematician, um, that I started out in newspapers. But I did uh, start working on theory that wouldn't die eight or nine years ago, when after a year of working, I was totally thrilled when I could search for the word Bayesian on the web and I got 100,000 hits. Last week I searched for Bayesian and I got more than 13 million hits. So today I want to talk to you about this revolutionary explosion of interest in Bayes' rule and how Bayes became a pervasive tool for decision making uh, based on incomplete information. So in the process I Hope we'll come to understand why many of you in this room are real revolutionaries about a very fundamental issue, analyzing information, making data-based decisions. Now here at Microsoft, you all know the uh, 1998 patent for a spam filter that had Bayes embedded in it. But before I talk about the spam filter patent, I want to talk about something that's make, making headlines more recently. And I'm going to see if I can work this. There. Air France Jet Flight 447 took off in the spring of 2009 from Rio de Janeiro, bound overnight for Paris, met a high altitude, very intense electrical storm, disappeared without a trace, 228 people aboard. Last fall, I spent the afternoon with Olivier Ferrante, the man in charge of the successful undersea search for the wreckage of Flight Air, Air France Flight 447. He's an aviation engineer, 
who works for the French Civil Aviation Agency and remembers with great fondness two years that he spent in Renton at the FAA Research Lab. Ferrante was in charge of what became the world's biggest and most high-tech naval search ever. These are the planes, uh, two black boxes, which as you can see are actually red and white. They're the size of shoe boxes. And they were lost in a vast terrain the size of Switzerland, with the to mountainous topography of Switzerland, 12,000 feet under the ocean. After almost two years of fruitless searching by some of the world's leading oceanographers, Ferrante hires some of the same people who are in the naval search chapter of Theory That Wouldn't Die. And their Bayesian search software calculated the most probable site for finding Air France 447, where it was found last April, after an undersea search of one week. A two-year fruitless search, Bayes finds it in one week. Now, for me, the really revolutionary thing about this is that the French authorities formally, in writing, publicly, credited Bayes with the discovery. Because as we're going to see, a lot of people didn't dare even mention the word Bayes for decades of the 20th century. But to understand this explosion of interest in Bayes and why you all are such revolutionaries, we have to go back a bit to Thomas Bayes. And given the time constraints, I'm going to really race until the Second World War and the fight in the North Atlantic over the U-boats. But I hope we're going to see two big patterns emerging. And the first is that Bayes becomes an extreme example of a gap between the real world and academia. That military super secrecy during the Second World War and during the Cold War afterwards had a profound effect on Bayes. That Microsoft Research's use of Bayes is in a direct lineal descent from the Bayesian warfare against the U-boats during the Second World War and that Microsoft Research was a key player in bringing Bayes to the public's attention and making it publicly acceptable. Now, Bayes' rule, of course, is named for the Reverend Thomas Bayes. He was a Presbyterian minister, an amateur mathematician, lived in the uh, first part of the 1700s in England. We know very little about him. His, the ubiquitous picture of him is almost certainly of someone who lived much later. We do know that he discovered his theorem during an inflammatory religious controversy launched by the Scottish philosopher David Hume. And the question was whether scientists or, or others could use evidence about the real world uh, to make rational conclusions about God the creator. They, they called it God the cause, God the primary cause, or just the cause. We don't know that Bayes wanted to prove the existence of God, the cause, but we do know that he tried to deal with the issue of cause and effect mathematically. And in, do so, in so doing, of course, he produced this simple one-line theorem that allows us to start with an initial idea. Bayes actually used the word guess, said if you don't have enough reason uh, to guess one way or another, guess 50-50 and then commits us to modifying that initial idea with objective new information. And then the really tough part is changing your mind in the face of the new data. But Bayes didn't believe enough in his theorem to publish it. He files it away in a notebook and dies 10 or 15 years later. And going through Bayes' paper, a friend of his, who's all another Presbyterian minister, amateur mathematician named James Price, Richard Price, excuse me, uh, spends a long time rewriting and editing the essay and gets it published in a journal that no one pays any attention to. A few years later, however, a young professional mathematician, uh, Pierre-Simon Laplace, most known today for the Laplace uh, transform, discovers the rule independently in Paris uh, in 1774 and calls it the probability of causes. Now, Laplace mathematized every field of science known to his era. 
he uh, helped turn Newton's hypothesis about gravitation into a natural law. And he spent 40 years of his career off and on transforming Bayes' rule into the form that's used today. Then he actually used it. And until about 50 years ago, Bayes' rule was known as Laplace's work. And he's a hero of mine. I think he's wonderful. Now, over the course of Thomas Bayes' and Laplace's lifetimes, Western scientists and governments worked very, very hard at compiling and accumulating lots of precise and trustworthy objective data. And by the mid-1800s, any up-to-date statistician rejected Bayes' rule, preferred to judge the probability of an event according to how frequently it occurred. And they become, of course, known as the frequentists, and they will be the great opponents of Bayes' rule up until a very short time ago. Because for them, modern science required both objectivity and precise answers, and Bayes' approximations and a measure of belief were anathema. Uh, they called it a amok. Uh, now, by the time the Second World War began in 1939, Bayes was virtually taboo among sophisticated statisticians. Fortunately, Alan Turing wasn't a statistician. He was a mathematician, of course. And besides fathering uh, the modern computer, computer science, uh, software, artificial intelligence, Turing machine, Turing test, he will also father the modern Bayesian revival. So I want to switch gears a little bit and dwell on Turing's story and the great battle of the North Atlantic Ocean against the German U-boats, because out of this battle, a lot of Microsoft research's interest in Bayes will grow. Also, I want to dwell on Turing's story because it illustrates how Bayes worked as a paper and pencil method, as one of the earliest computer methods, and as an illustration of military secrecy and the effect thereof. Now, it's important to remember that during the Second World War, England will be cut off from the farms and factories of France and will be able to feed only one in three of its residents. And it will depend on a convoys of unarmed merchant marine ships delivering 30 million tons of food and strategic supplies each year to, to Britain from the North and South America and from Africa. Hitler said point blank, U-boats will win the war. Churchill said after the war, the only thing that really scared me were those U-boats. And the German U-boats did sink almost 3,000 Allied ships and kill more than 50,000 merchant seamen. Now the German Navy ordered the U-boats around the Atlantic via radio messages that were encrypted with word scrambling machines called the Enigmas. And this is a photograph of one that comes from Frode Weyerud's uh, CryptoCellar website. To standardize their communications, the German military purchased 40,000 Enigma machines and distributed them among the different services like the uh, German railways, uh, the army, the air force, the diplomatic corps, the Italian, Spanish allies, and so on. And each group incorporated its own security measures and its own complexities. And of them all, the German Navy operated the most complex Enigma code. Now, if I can work this, an Enigma code uh, looks much like a very sturdy but elaborate typewriter. It had wires coming out of here. We should see the wires, but they're not attached at this point. Uh, it had wheels. Wire. These are the wheels. It had wiring. Uh, it had code books, uh, tables. Some of it was doubly encoded. And there were features that could be changed within hours if necessary. And they could turn, churn out millions upon millions of permutations. And no one, German intelligence, German military, or the British, ever thought that the British would be able to read those messages. Now, Turing had been trained at Cambridge, of course. He'd had a postdoc in Princeton, New Jersey. He returned in the summer of 1939 and spends the summer on his own uh, on the Enigma 
uh, codes. He goes to Bletchley Park occasionally to consult with experts at the British super secret decoding center, coding center that's north of London. He has standing orders that the day after war is declared, he's to report there full time. And on September 4, 1939, he reports for duty. When he arrived, he was 27. He looked 16, people said. He was handsome, athletic, shy, very nervous. And he had lived openly as a homosexual in Cambridge. He would devote the next six years to the Enigma and to other coding and decoding projects and to the machines uh, that ne uh, were needed for decoding. Now, when he arrives in Blatchley Park, no one is working on the all-important Navy Enigma. Turing, however, liked to work alone, and he said uh, afterwards that after a few weeks, he decided that no one else was doing anything about it, and I could have it to myself. And he begins to attack it. He first assigns a machine to eliminate the wheel arrangements um, that couldn't produce the words he thought should be in the German messages. And then he developed a very Bayesian system that let him guess a stretch of letters in the original message, hedge his bets, measure his belief in their validity by assessing their probabilities, and add more clues as they could be found. Now, Frau de Weyrud, who, who gave us this picture, and this is an actual naval uh, enigma, not just one for, the, uh, for one of the other services. Uh, he and some other uh, cryptography experts are trying to decode the remaining enigma messages. And he said that even today, a modern computer can take weeks or months to solve a naval enigma message if all they know is the original language the message was written in, if they have to do it by brute force. But if they have a machine like Turing, the one that he invented to test the possible wheel combinations, and if they can guess some of the words in the messages, then a modern computer can, can break an enigma, naval enigma message in, message in seconds or less. Turing, of course, didn't have modern computers, but the principle remains the same. He had his machine, and next he had to decide he had to be able to guess the most probable words in the message. So Bletchley Park begins to collect uh, clues. And the best source of them were a stretch of weather station ships that the Germans stationed across the North Atlantic in the far north. And they relayed weather reports to the mainland, to the continent. Uh, now, of course, weather is uh, standardized vocabulary that's repeated a lot. So it was ideal for them, uh, weather for the night, beacons lit as ordered, and so on. And they could uh, determine uh, the likelihood of, of their guesses a bit by, watching, by getting clues from the British weather reports uh, from ships in the North English Channel. Uh, in, in a fundamental breakthrough, though, Turing realizes that he couldn't systematize his hunches or compare their probabilities without a unit of measurement. He names his unit a ban for the town of it's nearby called Banbury. And he defined it as, quote, about the smallest change of weight of evidence that is directly perceptible to human intuition. And he said that when odds of a <coughs> hypothesis would reach 50 to 1, they could figure they had the right words. This, of course, is basically the same as the bit that Claude Shannon discovered by using Bayes' rule at roughly the same time at Bell Telephone Laboratories. We don't know whether Turing developed the system on his own or whether he learned about it at Cambridge, uh, probably from lectures by Harold Jeffries. But by June of 1941, a year and a half after the war has started, Bletchley Park could read the uh, German messages the U-boat messages within an hour of their arrival in Bletchley Park. And for almost a month that summer, uh, no convoy is hit. The convoys are rooted around the U-boats. By the autumn of that year, by the autumn of 1941, this Bayes Bay system was critically short of typists, however, and junior clerks, otherwise known as girl power. And Turing and three others uh, 
write a, a personal letter to Churchill asking for more resources, and he responds immediately. Ian Fleming of James Bond fame planned a super elaborate raid to capture code books that Turing needed. Uh, and they were it was so complex, just reading it made me feel glad that they decided uh, not to do it. Navy seamen risked their lives and some died uh, collecting code books for Turing from sinking German ships. Now the system didn't always work. The German Navy added a fourth wheel and this machine actually has four, one, two, three, four wheels. And with the fourth wheel, for most of that year, the, the remaining year, Bletchley Park couldn't crack the U-boat the codes. Eventually, though, when the U.S. begins making a lot of the Turing's wheel testing machines, breaking the Enigma codes becomes routine. However, shortly after Germany attacks Russia that summer, in June of 41, the German army started using new and highly sophisticated word scrambling machines called the Lorenz machines and a family of ultra secret Lorenz codes. And a group of British mathematicians is assembled and spends a year uh, resorting to a variety of techniques to break the Lorenz codes. They use among others Bayes rule, priors, Turing's Bayesian scoring system, his fundamental unit of bands. And then they incorporated the Bayesian methods, some Bayesian methods, into the computers they were building to decrypt the German codes, the computers called the Colossi. They were, the, of course, the first large-scale electronic digital computers. They were built for a special purpose of decryption, but they were capable of making other com computations. Ten models were built. They were far ahead of anything at the time in the United States. The engineer who built the Colossi, Thomas Flowers, had strict orders to get the, the current model up and operational by June 1, 1944. He was not told why. He and his team, he said, we worked until our eyeballs, we thought our eyeballs were falling out. But they get it operational by June 1, and on June 4, uh, June 5, excuse me, a message comes from Hitler, signed by Hitler, to his uh, army commander in Normandy, Erwin Rommel. And Hitler tells Rommel that if there is an attack on the Normandy coastline, don't do anything for five days, because this will be a diversionary attack, and the real attack will come later, somewhere else. The message is decoded at Bletchley Park. It's raced by courier to Eisenhower, where he and his staff are trying to uh, decide when to launch the invasion of Normandy. Eisenhower can't tell his staff about Bletchley Park and the decoding, so he reads it and hands it back to the courier and then turns to his staff and says, we go in the morning, the morning of June 6, uh, 1944. And Eisenhower said that the war in Europe was shortened by Bletchley Park by at least two years. Now, a, a few days after Germany's surrender in May of 1945, uh, the British government issued a surprising and shocking order. Everything showing that mathematics, decoding, computers, Turing had helped win the war was declared super secret. All but two of the Colossi were destroyed. And I, I think it doesn't take a, someone, uh, a, a great uh, pundit, to, to realize that if without that order, Britain might well have become the leader of the computer age. And you all might be working in Manchester or Birmingham instead of the state of Washington. The orders also prevented mathematicians from becoming war heroes, in which case the modern word geek would have very different connotations. They'd have connotations of, of heroic accomplishment. Now, after the war, Turing, hard to imagine, hmm? <laughs> Now, after the war, Turing was working on computers and other projects. 
when two English spies for the Soviet Union uh, flee to Moscow to escape arrest. 1950. One was called, uh, named Guy Burgess. He was an openly homosexual diplomat. He'd been posted in Washington, D.C., and he was a graduate of Cambridge University. And the U.S. intelligence told the British that they had, the spies had been tipped off by another homosexual graduate of Cambridge University, an eminent art, art historian named Anthony Blunt. And the British government panics at the thought of a ring of homosexual spies from Cambridge. And the number of homosexuals arrested spikes. And on the first day of Queen Elizabeth's reign, uh, February 7, 1952, we've just uh, celebrated, or some of us have just celebrated her 60th year anniversary as queen, Turing is arrested for homosexual activity in the privacy of his home with a consenting adult. And less than a decade after Britain fought a war against Nazis who had conducted medical experiments on their prisoners, Turing is found guilty and sentenced to chemical castration. On June 7, 1954, the day after the 10th anniversary of the Normandy invasion that he had helped make possible, Turing, father of the computers we use today, uh, commits suicide. Anthony Blunt, on the other hand, who had started the witch hunt, is knighted and it's 55 years in 2009 before a British Prime Minister apologizes for its, the government's treatment of Turing. Now, two weeks ago, despite an international petition that some of you may have signed, uh, Prime Minister Cameron refused to pardon Turing. His work lived on in cryptography and especially in Bayesian theory because his wartime assistant, Jack Good, I.J. Good in his articles, uh, developed and published hundreds of articles on Bayesian theory after the war. But Turing wasn't the only one using Bayes during the war. The British Air Ministry had organized a small group of scientists uh, to improve its operational efficiency. And they used a lot of Bayes especially when only a few variables were, were involved. The U.S. Navy was very impressed and formed a group of 40 civilian physicists, mathematicians, chemists, and actuaries uh, that they called the Anti-Submarine Warfare Operations Research Group, ASWARP. It was headed by the physicist Philip Morris at MIT and by the Columbia chemist George Kimball. ASWARP was devoted not just to av avoiding the U-boats, as uh, Bletchley Park had been, uh, 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 with fewer resources, had, had done, but to actually hunting down U-boats and sinking them. And they used bays for small, detailed parts of big problems. For example, the number of aircraft needed to protect a convoy of boats, whether the air squadron should deviate from its regular flight plane, small problems. Now Morse at MIT will be start the direct link between the Second World War operations research battle against the U-boats and Microsoft research here in Redmond. Because Morse will become Ron Howard's PhD advisor and Ron Howard in turn will advise David Heckerman and Eric Horowitz at Stanford. I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story a bit uh, because after the war Despite Bayes' successes during the war, it emerged even, even more suspect and déclassé than before. And for 30 or 40 years of the Cold War, a small group of maybe 100 or more, more believers will struggle for acceptance. For example, when Jack Good, Turing's uh, statistical wartime assistant, gave a talk about Bayesian uh, theory at the Royal Statistical Society, the next speaker's opening words were, after that nonsense, Harvard Business School professors who developed Bayesian decision trees, Howard Rafa among them, were called socialists and so-called scientists. 
a Swiss visitor to Berkeley's very frequentist statistics department in the 1950s, realized he said it was kind of dangerous to espouse Bayes. So with the Cold War military applying Bayes' rule in secret, the Bayesians concentrated on building a mathematical theory that would make Bayes a respectable part of mathematics. And many Bayesians of that generation remember the precise moment when the Bayes' overarching logic would descend upon them like an epiphany, and they would talk about their religious conversions. Now, both sides were proselytizing during this period as their method was the one and only way to do statistics. Both sides used religious terms. When the Bayesian Dennis Lindley was appointed chair of, the English of an English statistics department, frequentists called him a Jehovah's Witness, elected pope. He, in turn, asked how to encourage Bayes, retorted, attend funerals. And frequentists answered that if Bayesians would only do as Thomas Bayes had done, and published after they were dead, we should all be saved a lot of trouble. Now, as a result, during the Cold War, there were very few civilian applications of Bayes in the public arena. For example, in 1972, statisticians were still wrestling with the problem of how do you deal with something that has never happened. And MIT physicist Norman Rasmussen was asked to make one of the first studies of nuclear power plant safety. Uh, nuclear power plants had never had an accident before, so the frequentists had no way of judging uh, the, likely, the uh, probability uh, of a future accident. Now, Rasmussen did have the failure rates of pumps and valves and things like that that he could use, but it didn't produce enough data. So he had to turn to expert opinion and even to Bayesian analysis. And both were incendiary sources of information at the time for something as uh, incendiary as a nuclear power plant safety plan. Rasmussen went to California to Stanford to consult with Ron Howard and his partner Jim Matheson, and they encouraged him to use Bayes. And Rasmussen's report in, issued in 1974 predicted what actually happened at Three Mile Island, that the core damage wouldn't always be catastrophic, that human error and radioactivity released outside the building could be significant problems, but he hid the big bad word Bayes in the appendix of volume three of a massive multi-volume report to the government. By the late 1980s, however, pieces were falling together for the Bayesian statisticians. And for them, imaging was, was forcing the issue for them. Industrial automation at the time, uh, the military medical diagnostics, were producing blurry images with ultrasound machines, PET scans, MRIs, electron micrographs, telescopes, military aircraft, infrared sensors. And all these blurry images raised the question of what did the original object look like. Uh, that seemed to be ideal for Bayesian probability of causes. But Laplace's method involved the integration of functions, and with too many variables, it was just hopelessly complex. But Bayesians didn't realize that the key to making Bayes useful in the workplace would be computational ease and not more polished theory. Dennis Lindley, the theorist who'd been programming his own computer since 1965 and who regarded Bayes as ideal for computing, he wrote me, I consider it a major mistake of my professional life not to have appreciated the need for computing rather than mathematical analysis. I should have seen that Bayes enabled one to compute numerical answers. But many academic statisticians of those generations had started out as abstract mathematicians who regarded a computer as a cop-out. And it was a particularly poignant case involving a Canadian mathematician who lives in Vancouver now, uh, Keith Hastings, 
who published a paper in 1970 with what's now called the Metropolis Algorithm or the Hastings Metropolis Algorithm. And Hastings used Markov chains, Monte Carlo sampling techniques, dropped out of research a year later because no one noticed he cared about his paper, and he didn't even learn about the importance of his work for 20 years after he had retired. And Hastings told me with some anguish in his voice that his work was ignored because, quote, a lot of statisticians were not oriented toward computing. They, they took these theoretical courses, they cranked out theoretical papers, and some of them wanted an exact answer, not estimates, definitely not measures of belief. When um, Dennis Lindley's student, Adrian Smith on the left, and the American Alan Gelfand on the right, finally put the pieces together in 1989 for the Bayesian statisticians. They had Bayes, Gibbs sampling, Monte Carlo, Markov chains, iterations, and they wrote their watershed synthesis about MCMC very fast, uh, figuring that other people would pe the, put the pieces together too, but they wrote, also wrote it very carefully. In, thir in 12 pages, they used the word Bayes only five times. Asked Gelfand why, he told me, there was always some concern about using the B word, a natural defensiveness on the part of Bayesians in terms of rocking the boat. We were always an oppressed minority, trying to get some recognition. And even if we thought we were doing things the right way, we were only a small component of the statistical community, and we didn't have much outreach into the scientific community. But the next 10 years after that paper, the Bayesians pass it in what they still remember as a frenzy of activity. Because using MCMC and the relatively cheap, powerful workstations that were coming, becoming available, and a few years later they got uh, off-the-counter software from uh, Adrian Smith's uh, student David Spiegelhalter, who called them bugs. Bayesian could, Bayesians could finally, after two and a half centuries, compute complex and realistic problems. When Gelfand and Smith gave an MCMC workshop at Ohio State early in 1991, they were astonished when almost 80 scientists appeared, not statisticians, but scientists. And with outsiders like this, from computer science, physics, artificial intelligence, refreshing and broadening Bayes, depoliticizing, secularizing it, it was adopted almost overnight. Now, during this frenetic period of Bayes' history, Microsoft becomes a key player. Jim Matheson and Ron Howard had made the breakthrough as far as Bayesian networks were concerned, and Matheson emphasized to me that we regarded ourselves as engineers. So they organized the Stanford Research Institute to apply Bayes to very complex problems, not the simple ones that had been done during the war. Ron Howard told me what I did was to combine the theory of decision making that goes back to Laplace and Bayes when they're making simple decisions under uncertainty with balls and urns, and combine it with systems operation and engineering research from the Second World War in terms of actual decisions that people who lie awake nights are concerned about. Now, by 1990, another, uh, it, during this frenzied period, another person interested in Bayes <laughs> enters the picture, and that's Nathan Mirvold, who was helping to organize Microsoft research. He'd been a physics student and a physics postdoc, and had read and met Ed Jaynes, and, who was a Bayesian physicist. And he, Mirvold became interested in Bayes, not for inference or decision making, but for artificial intelligence, because it would help quantify the uncertainties uh, for uh, machines that could think. When he learned that his high school classmate, David Heckerman, had formed a software company with Eric Horvitz and Jack Brees, using Bayesian networks for diagnosing lymph node diseases, Mervold convinced Heckerman to join Microsoft. 
I'm sorry, I should have shown you Ron Howard's picture a long time ago. But here's the first meeting of the three of them when they come uh, to Microsoft to explain uh, what they've been doing. And Eric Horvitz tells the story about how Mervold got him to join Microsoft by leaning forward at the meeting and saying that Bill Gates is a Bayesian and Bill will give you the freedom to do to innovate broadly. And here during this first meeting is Horvitz explaining Bayes' rule to Microsoft. Two weeks ago, I asked Mervold how Bill Gates became a Bayesian. And he said, well, when he was talking to uh, Horvitz, I was stretching it a bit, he said. <laughs> he said, if you did an experiment at the time, asking Gates, uh, Bill Gates 10 questions, it would have been unclear that he was a Bayesian. On the other hand, Mervault said he always supported it. And in fact, uh, three years later in 96, it was Bill Gates who attracted technology world uh, attention to, to Bayesian networks when he said that Microsoft's competitive advantage lies in its ex expertise in Bayesian networks. Heckerman says at that point, people's eyebrows started going up. But the general public, people like me, first took notice in 1998 with Microsoft's patent for the Bayesian spam filters. Good. Uh, it was filed, applied for in 1998, up here, and uh, approved in December of 2000. And if you read further into the patent on, in column 27, Oh, I'm having trouble reading it. Uh, number 17, I think, right? This, uh, they use a naive Bayesian classifier, a limited dependence Bayesian classifier, a Bayesian network classifier, a decision tree. It's got loads loaded with Bayes. I don't think anyone who didn't live through that period can appreciate what that spam filter did the dramatic impact it had. At the time, there were, uh, they were saying that some people were spending a half hour a day cleaning out the spam from their, from their email accounts. Uh, there were thoughts of congressional uh, legislation, of lawsuits. Um, I began every morning swam, swamped with Viagra ads. And, and I have to tell you that Viagra wasn't something I was really thinking about buying. But, but for me, this, that period is crystallized by a comment that a rather elderly, quite proper, but very uh, distinguished author of children's books said. She said, you know, nowadays I hate to start work in the morning because when I turn on the computer, I have to go through screen after screen of graphic pornography. Actually, that's not what she said. She described it. My, my husband says, I can't tell you. <laughs> so this Bayesian revolution was a modern paradigm shift for a very pragmatic age. And it happened overnight, not because people changed their minds about the philosophy of science, but because suddenly Bayes worked. The battle between Bayesians and frequentists subsides, prominent uh, Frequentists moderated their positions in public. Brad, Bradley Efren, a Ma National Medal of Science recipient, who wrote a classic defense of frequentism, told me, I've always been a Bayesian. The controversy is not entirely over, of course. Their holdouts remain in uh, clinical medicine, in the judiciary, even in physics. Last April, for example, a British appeals uh, judge, you probably know, uh, banned the use of bays in British courtrooms, and he actually overturned a man's conviction for murder because the statistics of the number of Nike shoes in Great Britain was not firm. And he wants firm statistics, not approximations. And experts have said his decision could affect virtually every case involving circumstantial evidence in Britain, and an international committee of statisticians is working on the problem. Physicists 
are still using frequentism. They're using it for the Higgs boson search. There was a big conference held recently uh, about the statistics being used in the search. An attendee told me the astronomers were taking mostly a Bayesian approach for the issues. The particle physicists were mostly considering frequentist approaches. They appear to be the last strong holdouts in science against Bayesian methods. And the statisticians, he said, were divided. Thank you. I, I'm happy to take questions. Well, sure. Can, I, can we go back to the um, to the um, the Air France case that you started with, just for a sec? Because I've thought about this distinct. You know, what's the difference between Bayesian statistics and Neiman Pearson frequency statistics? For a long time, I've never quite, even after reading your book and reading a lot of other things, quite got the the essence of it. So here's the Air France thing. You've got the, the that the Bayesians use some some the Bayesian techniques to, to, to find the, the plane. Now, the frequentists would say something like, you know, you shouldn't be using prior probabilities. But it seemed to me that frequentists, frequentists would use them as well if would be using them too, because surely they wouldn't be searching in the Pacific Ocean. They're 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 making a judgment. Okay. about that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you think about it that way, it looks like there's a gradation between them and you know, these two approaches. Uh, They're making a decision about where okay. to look. They're going to look in the Atlantic. Okay. Even I, I even asked Olivier Ferrante what Bayes did for him. Yeah. Uh, during the second year of the search, a group of very eminent oceanographers looked not on the path that the jet had taken was on. And this is the last known point. Uh, they went up here. They thought they could use uh, the currents and the wind patterns uh, to deduce how the, the jet had moved. Um, that didn't work. <laughs> okay. As a matter of fact, uh, Larry Stone, the Bayesian who uh, is in the book and uh, was also worked on the prog program um, at Mitron, um, in, which is a small uh, uh, defense contractor in, in Virginia, uh, he said when he heard that the oceanographers were going to go up to the north, uh, he, was, he was stunned. I asked Ferrante, I told him that. And Fronte said, I was too. Now, I'm not convinced that Fronte understood the strength of the word in English, stunned. His English is magnificent. But, but, but étonnant in, in France, French is not as, as strong as it is in English. Uh, but he was surprised. So what Ferrante said that Bayes had done for him was to be able to combine all the evidence gathered over two years of searching. He said that the FA, that the, these civilian safety agents uh, uh, work very closely internationally. They all know each other. They work and cooperate with each other. And he had data from uh, almost 10 uh, Russian crashes. He had another that was quite close to the Air France from South Africa. Uh, he had all the evidence from the oceanographers and so on. And Bayes allowed him to combine it all, gave him the probable location, and then it gave him a day-to-day a -day search plan for how he could allocate his, his assets. And frequentism wouldn't have done that. But the frequentists did, it sounds like they did apply prior probabilities here, except they were just wrong. I mean, they went looking somewhere else. They were actually, depending on a Coast Guard search program that had been done by these same people that's, that's talked about in the book, that uses the uh, wind and the water currents to find lo you know, lost sailors and so on. Uh, but the crash occurred right near the equator. And at the changing of the seasons, the currents and the winds are apparently very wild. 
and they, it, it just wasn't adequate. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. What do you uh, believe was the single most contributing factor to the uh, intense animosity that developed between these two schools of thought? I think much of the tenor was set by, um, hmm, come on, uh, Fisher, he, who was uh, apparently a, a very damaged personality. Someone would ask him a question about science, uh, even, even a colleague, and he would interpret it as a personal attack. And his career was spent in a series of scientific arguments at meetings and publications and so on, several at a time. Um, and it's kind of hard. I mean, Fisher was a very, very important statistician. He was the founder of modern statistics. Very important. So this didn't develop until. Oh, he kept it up from the 1920s until well into the 1950s. He became so extreme then that when a Bayesian at the uh, Department of Health, uh, NIH, was using Bayes to pr show that cigarette smoking uh, was probably a, a cause of lung cancer, Fisher said, no, it's the opposite way. Lung cancer probably causes the smoking. So I'm curious whether in your research you have found examples of, uh, of instances where these two school of thought has actually collaborated in producing something that neither was able to do alone. No. No. To, nowadays, yes. Nowadays, people apparently pick what's, what works for their project. Uh, Sorry, you want to say, Sherry? There's a Bayesian at Stanford who talked about how, when, as he was a young man, would walk down the halls of, of the statistics department at Stanford, and there were signs making fun of Bayes uh, on faculty, on professors' doors. Um, he, he was very wounded. He told me that story three times. Um, that, that's not, that, that doesn't encourage cooperation. <laughs> I have to make a comment that, that David Heckman and I both, we, we both took Brad Efron's course and we, we, we both liked him very much and we read his paper, Why I'm Not a Bayesian, very carefully and, and to hear him saying that he's a Bayesian now is very exciting yes. to us. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting and exciting. Tony? Yes, I, I, I had a dark past. I was a physicist for some years and in 1978 I was in the physics department uh, where we wrote papers using frequentist analysis to analyze physics data which seems to be entirely appropriate. But one of my colleagues was a guy named Jeff Daniel who wrote one of the first applications of Bayesian maximum entropy to image reconstruction with incomplete and noisy data. So Daniel and Gull in 1972, much though I, 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 Eric and David have to be praised, I think there was a lot of impact on Bayesian in image reconstruction. It was a lot of, of physics, you, a physicist a using it from the 30s. Fermi, fine, uh, fine and money, James, of and so on. So, um, yeah. But Daniel and Gold was where I was introduced to. We used both. Okay, one last question. Or two. <laughs> last question. Um, do, do you do you see that that what, um, any the Bayesian inference making inroads into like the classical places where frequentists um, live, like in um, you know agricultural research and in and in um, drug testing. It's like really classical areas where it was all invented in some ways. Berkeley. Berkeley would be one of those. Yeah. Uh, but you're specifically asking for the state universities, the well, the land like, grant you know, universities. About about um, you know Iowa State. Okay, okay. okay. I, I'll have to tell a story. I, I've been, I got a series of emails from someone who says he uses, has used Bayes for many years for animal genetics in a land grant thing. And so I wrote Dennis Lindley that. He, he's, Dennis Lindley has been wonderful and written, written me dozens of, of letters. 
So I thought he'd like this, and he wrote back and said that this gentleman is a natural Bayesian polluted by frequentist ideas. <laughs> Yeah, second question? Oh, yeah, I did. Um, okay. That's my I, thought job. I, was, I thought I was denied mind. the second question, no, no, no. but it was, but this is a Brad Efron question. Um, do you think that, he, would he say that, maybe either of you, that, would he say that bootstrapping is a, is a, uh, is a Bayesian technique? Ah. Uh, or is, it seems to me it straddles. No, I'm just I'm curious. I'm curious. But I'm passing that one to you. Brad. Uh, I didn't ask him that. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you called it a basic. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thank you.